Father, we thank you for the occasion that brings us together again tonight. And we pray, Lord, that the blessing that we receive will outweigh coming out on such a chilly and uh, wintry night. Father, we pray especially for the requests that have been raised for Sister Harrison's foot, for Sherilyn's family and Tony's, for Pam's safe uh, travel, and Lord, for all of our unspoken requests that are on our heart that we just haven't mentioned, and for those we may have forgotten. We pray in a special way, Lord, that you would bless this church, bless our pastor, bless each of the members here, Lord, as we prepare ourselves for the reconciliation and healing weekend that's coming up on the 18th. We pray, Lord, that this will be an uplifting and memorable and deeply impressioning experience on us all. We pray these blessings in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. we begin with another word of prayer. Father in heaven, we ask in Jesus' name that you'd come near to us in the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would reveal to us your Son. Reveal to us, Lord, your will for our sanctification and our salvation. Help us to be able to perceive it by spiritual revelation and not just cognitive understanding. Lord, we extend our prayers to the um, many thousands of federal workers who are on furlough because of the government shutdown. Many people who are even near to us in terms of family, friends, and even church members. We ask, Lord, that you would move and intervene by your spirit on the hearts of men so that a resolution would be found and individuals would be able to go back to work and able to support their families once again. In Jesus' name, amen. In continuation of our lesson this past Sabbath on high places in which we surveyed the core message of Second Chronicles, we want to return there now and um, we're going to look at the key text which shapes the theology of the entire book of um, Second Chronicles, yea, even First and Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. And I'm sure many of us can perhaps even quote it from memory. And it says, let's read it together, Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Wonderful. I have a few questions based on that opening verse and that is first, what is the context of this promise? What's going on when God makes this promise? First of all, who, who is he making that promise to? 
Does anybody have a mic? Israel in general, but who is he speaking to specifically? Solomon. Right, he's speaking to Solomon. And what was it that occasioned this conversation with Solomon? What happened that caused God to come to Solomon to say this? What happened? It's close to sacrifices, very much. You're, you're, you're very warm. <laughs> Elder? Elder Logan? Yes. L- let me have you use the mic if you don't <laughs> mind. Solomon prayed this beautiful prayer. And in response to it, the Lord answered by... Um, setting the altar aflame and he came to Solomon later uh, again personally Mm -hmm. and he he said well he made promises to him and he asked him for what blessings that he wanted. That's right. Very good. So it was actually the dedication of the temple that was built in Jerusalem by Solomon and at that temple dedication Solomon prayed this prayer asking the Lord to set his name on this temple and to cause it to be a place where whenever the people prayed towards that place if they ever were estranged from him or in need of repentance or forgiveness um, or re- reformation or revival, that God would allow this to be the place where those prayers would be heard. And so God comes, he does send down the fire that day to affirm the prayer, but then after that he comes to Solomon and he speaks to him specifically to say, yes, I'm going to do exactly what you have said. This promise is so powerful that you remember that many years later when Daniel is in captivity, in Babylon, thousands of miles away, that in captivity, three times a day, he kneels towards where? Towards Jerusalem. Not just to Jerusalem, but specifically towards the ruin of the temple. So even as the temple lies in ruin, Daniel prays towards the temple in order for God to fulfill his promise, and indeed God fulfills this promise. So the next question says, how is the temple central to this promise? How is the temple central to this promise? Everyone seems to be avoiding eye contact. (laughs) How is the temple central to this, this promise? God put the temple in the midst of his people, and the temple is the basis of the promise because the temple is the place where his name is. Am I right? So remember, the temple becomes a place where God makes his presence known among his people. He makes his presence known through his word, which for them was specifically the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. And then he mediates his presence presence through sacrifices. This is the basic function of the temple. Remember in Exodus, in the time of Moses, God said, let them make me a tabernacle that I may what? That I may dwell among them. God wants to be in the midst of his people. As a matter of fact, the wilderness tabernacle was made in such a way that it was right in the center of the camp. So the people were camped on all sides of the tabernacle in rows from the north, the east, the south, and the west. And God's Shekinah, or his glory, rose up or hovered over that tabernacle. And so his presence was there. But the presence of a holy God How can it be in the midst of an unholy people? Well, the only way it could be in the midst of an unholy people is if he provides a priesthood 
to mediate on their behalf and sacrifices that those priests will use in order to, by blood, cover the sins of the people so that God could be right in the midst of them. And also his word revealed his will, but the word also revealed how far from his will they were, that his will had been broken. They were not worthy. Indeed, we are not worthy of the presence of God. And so God mediates his presence to us through the sac through sacrifice, and he makes his word known to us so that the tabernacle that would be later replaced by Solomon's temple was meant to be the center of life. Allowing the tabernacle or the the, the um, temple to be the center of life was another way of allowing God to be the center of life, for God to be the focus of life. Everything was directed towards his presence, toward his word. And by the way, he not only had his Ten Commandments, but he also had the book of Moses that was there outside of the ark next to it, and all of the scriptures. And the priest, they taught and ministered the word, and they also administered the sacrifices so that the presence of God could be mediated among his people. Now, how would you summarize the meaning of the promise? How would you tell somebody what this, this promise means? Anybody? What's the meaning of this promise? If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. How would you summarize it? Well, I, I always thought that this was a text that was more of a, a, not so much a promise, but as a fact, that if his people would do that, then this is the natural result of what would happen. Well, it definitely is a fact. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you mind using the mic? In a definite way. Yes. He, he wanted to be a part of them. Right. He wanted that relationship. Go ahead. Right. And, and that relationship was based on certain conditions. That's right. That's right. And what would happen is he's saying to them in this promise, it is a fact, this, this is... It's a fact in the sense that these things are true. It's a promise in the sense that God is saying that if you ever fall away from me, that I'm showing you how I will respond if you want to come back. Right? I'm giving you an assurance. Right? So Solomon was asking God to make it so. And God says, yes, I promise I'll make it so. This is always going to work. Right? And so basically... If God's people fell into apostasy, which is nothing more than self-exaltation or idolatry, God would respond if they would come to him in humility, which is nothing more than self-abasement. And as a result, he would offer forgiveness, reconciliation, and blessing. This is the promise. This was always the way that God promised to respond to his people based on their coming back to him, their returning back to him. And so you're going to see throughout the book of Second Chronicles, which is really based on principles that are laid out in the book of Deuteronomy. 
right? As a matter of fact, at the end of Second Chronicles, they find the book of Deuteronomy hidden in the wall in the temple. And that's when Josiah initiates his, his final reforms. But based on the book of Deuteronomy, you find this pattern where the author, who's living long after the fact, is showing the blessings that accompany God's people when they're in right relationship with him, when God and his temple are as it should be. You see the condition of the temple being as it should be and the worship of God's people being completely towards God as it should be. And the blessings that he gives to the kings who respond in this way are successful building programs, victory in war, many children, um, support from the people, as well as large armies. Those are the patterns or the markers of success and faithfulness or blessing from God in Second Chronicles. Also, you see curses from God in Second Chronicles for kings who lead the people astray. They suffer military defeat. They gain displeasure from the people. And also, they suffer illness. That's the pattern that's given. Now, I want to clarify with these blessings and these curses, that does not mean that the person who's faithful never faces any suffering or any trial. That's not the case. As a matter of fact, every single faithful king receives a test. Every single faithful um, king um, sees some sort of enemy or some sort of invasion or something like that. The difference is the ones who are unfaithful, who are being cursed, when the curse comes, they're defeated by the curse. The, the curse reveals the fact that they're out of right relationship with God. But the faithful kings, when the challenge comes or the test comes, the test of faithfulness comes, then God always intervenes and demonstrates his presence among his people. So that's something that we need to understand. Sometimes we think um, the Bible is teaching that if you write with God, your life's going to be blessed, there's not going to be any problems. If you're not right with God, your life's going to be cursed, and it's going to be full of problems. When actually what the Bible teaches is that that is true to some degree, but even those who are faithful to God, God always sends the test of faith. There's always going to be a challenge. You're going to endure something that comes to test your faith. The difference between the blessed person, though, and the cursed person is that the blessed person is always going to be comforted in his trial by the presence of God. God is going to be in the midst of the trial with you. That's why the Hebrew boys, they say, if you, um, if you put us in the fiery furnace, our God is able. But if he doesn't, we're not going to serve you anyhow. Because they, they had the assurance of God's ultimate deliverance and his continual presence, even if you go into the, into the furnace. And what God demonstrates is, yes, you've gone into the furnace, and you know what? I'm going to come into the furnace with you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. And through the floods, they shall not drown you. And through the fire, you will not be burned. Neither will you be scorched. For I am the Holy One of Israel, your God. That's the promise. You're going to go in the fire. You're going to go in the river. But he's going to be with you. He's going to be with you. All right? Now, what I would like to do is I would like to share the example of a king who shows us just how this works. He's a very good example. He's actually the first prominent example in Second Chronicles of how this whole idea of returning to God or giving God a whole heart works. So this is coming from 2 Chronicles 14, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to read through it quickly. 2 Chronicles 14, verses 1 through 5. So this is going to be Asa, who is the third king of Israel after the kingdom is divided. 
So you may remember that this is the Mediterranean, this is the Sea of Galilee, this is the Dead Sea, this is Jerusalem. So what you had was the northern kingdom of Israel up here and the southern kingdom of Judah down here, right? Remember, David, he was king of all 12 tribes. Solomon was king of all 12, 12 tribes. Well, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, Jeroboam came and they rebelled against Rehoboam and he, Jeroboam, got the northern tribe of Israel and then Jeroboam was left with the, the two um, southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And so now you have two kingdoms, a divided monarchy. And so Rehoboam had his son Abijah and Abijah had his son Asa. And Asa now is the king that we're talking about now. It says, so Abijah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. Then Asa, his son, reigned in his place in his days. The land was quiet for how long, everybody? Ten years. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, his God, for he removed the altars of the foreign gods and the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah, and the kingdom was what, everybody? Quiet under him. So for the first 10 years of his reign, Asa initiates revival and reformation. He eradicates idolatry in Judah, and God blesses him with peace for 10 years. In his 10th year, however, there is a um, Ethiopian by the name of Zerah who comes to attack Judah, and they attack um, Asa and his army. Of course, we see, reading about Asa, the benefits of his faithfulness to God. You have successful building programs. You have um, progeny. You have the, um, the goodwill of the people. And you also have um, a good army. So he has a little over 500,000 men between Judah and, and Benjamin. But this guy comes with a million men, probably more than a million, right? He comes with all of these folks. And listen to what Asa says when he sees this army that practically he should not be able to defeat. In verse 11 it says, And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. You see that? God is faithful to him. But listen to this encouragement and warning that Asa receives on his way back from that war. It says in 15 verse 1, Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are, what everybody? With him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, what? He will forsake you. For a long time, Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without the law. Remember, back to this. He's really saying without life that's centered around the temple, without the true God, without a teaching priest, right? Without the law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. And in those times there was no peace to the one who went out nor the one who came in, but great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of all lands. So nation was destroyed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with, their, in, with every adversity. But you be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. You hear that? In other words, this whole idea of coming to God and giving your whole self to him is something that you don't just do initially and then you're good. You've got to do it and keep on doing it. 
Really, Ellen White says, this should be our first work every single day. Consecrate yourself to God first thing every morning. You give your whole self to him again. And Asa is going to show us why this is so important. Because after he receives these words, he goes and he conducts another reform and another revival. And they all commit them, themselves unto God. And the people say, look, if there's anybody that doesn't want to be faithful to God, we're going to put them to death. And Asa's mother, the queen mother, she's found worshiping Asherah, the goddess of fertility. And when Asa finds out, he removes his mother from being queen. That's how serious he was about them being faithful to God. And so this is from the 10th year. So he has peace for 10 years, and he has this big war, and God delivers him. And then for the rest of his reign, until the 36th year of his reign, he has peace. But in the 36th year, something happens. The king of northern Israel, Baasha, actually comes down near the border of Judah, and he starts building up a city near the border of Judah, Judah called Ramah. And what he's going to do at Ramah, he's going to put a blockade on Judah so that no goods come, can come in or out. He's going to block them from all trade, and basically it's a siege. Basically he's going to choke them out. And Asa becomes so afraid because of this. You know what he does? He contacts, this is not quite right, but let's say up here is Syria. He, he contacts, he sends an envoy with money up to Syria, and he tells Syria, he said, look, I know that you have an alliance with Israel, but I'm going to pay you more than they pay you if you come and you help me. And so Syria said, oh, money looks good. I'm going to help you. So the Syrian king comes down into Israel and starts attacking cities so that when Baasha hears of it in Ramah, he leaves there and he goes up to try to save, defend his own um, cities. So when that happens, it just so happens now that a prophet comes to Asa because Asa goes up to Ramah with his guys to take away all of the, the, um, the blocks and the building tools and everything so he can use that to build his own stuff. On his way back, 16, verse 7, it says, And at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. You see that? So when he gets into this trouble, he has trouble. He doesn't come here, right? He doesn't remember, this is, he doesn't think this is a test of faith. No, he goes and relies on man to fix his problems for him. And as a result, he says, look, he said God would have taken care of Israel and given you Syria too. But you didn't rely on him. Look at how he helped you in the past, but now you didn't rely on him. And then look at this promise in verse 9. It's one of the most precious, precious promises in scripture. I love this text. It says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this, you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. You know, did you hear that? Your version may say on behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him or whose heart is blameless towards him. Um, this is actually a better translation here where it says loyal, but literally the Hebrew word that's being used here for perfect or blameless or loyal actually means whole or complete. Right? Whole, the heart that is completely given over to God. Right? Do you hear that? This says that God is looking down on the earth, looking. Where can I find somebody 
who will give me their whole heart. Because wherever I find them, wherever I find her, I'm going to show myself strong in the life of that person. He's looking down at Detroit. Where's the person with a heart that's completely given to me? I'm going to show myself strong on behalf of that person. What a promise. But he said, but you didn't do that. So from now on, you're going to have war. Verse 10. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison. For he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Note that the acts of Asa first and last are indeed written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet and his malady was severe. Yet in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. So Asa rested with his fathers. He died in the 41st year of his reign. You see that? Now, Asa's life shows us an example of what it means to live with God continually as the center of our lives so that our hearts are fully given to him. Now, here's a problem that the people of God face today. We say that we're Christians and that our hearts belong to Jesus, but when we run into trouble and trial, and challenge and difficulty, where do we put our trust and our dependence? Where does it go? Right? So I have physical distress. My very first thought is, how am I gonna how am I gonna get the doctor to fix this? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to a doctor. The text is not saying that. But do you know that a believer, the very first place we should turn with physical ailment is to the Lord? I know that sounds crazy. But we're supposed to say, Lord, I'm sick. What does this mean? And what do you want me to do? Right? Many times we face all sorts of difficulty and trial, not only individually, not only as families, but as a church and as a Christian community. And the very first place that we look is some sort of human devising or some sort of mechanism of man in order to tweak or help our problems. We say we trust God, but then when, when enrollment goes down at the school, when tithe and offering goes down at the church, when attendance is low and the young adults are missing, then we say, well, you know what? It's because we need better marketing. You know what? It's because we need better plans. You know what? We need a marketing plan, a strategic plan. You know what? Well, maybe if we, or maybe if we, idea, 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 just coming up like popcorn all over the place. But what did God say? God says, return to me. The difficulty, the trial, the test, they're all supposed to cause us to turn to God with humility and dependence and faith. If my people who are called by my name would humble. Does that mean that God will not show us plans that we should make? No, that's not what I'm saying. But we don't rely on human devising. We rely on the Lord, our God. What we need more than anything else is right relationship with God. That's why when we come into a new year and we see so many things in our lives that are out of place, oftentimes our response is a worldly and earthly and human response. Well, I'm going to do such and such to get things in place. If I have just a little more discipline in this area over here, if I exert myself just a little bit more strong, if I really, really plan and, and, and put my ducks in a row, if you know, I resolve that I'm going to, right? All of these things that are meant to help and tweak and update and upgrade and benefit rather than this idea of turning our whole selves, our whole hearts, our whole lives to God in faith and trust 
and humility and dependence, believing in his promise, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. And that's the key right there. Because the lack of humility is because we've taken ourselves and putting ourselves, put ourselves at the center of life. That's what we've done. And so we need to humble ourselves to turn to God and say, God, you know, I don't know. So my eyes are on you. God watches to see if we're going to turn to him in time of trial and difficulty like that. With our whole selves. The eyes of the Lord range to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who put their, whose heart is whole or complete or loyal towards him. Now, in the New Testament, this is our last move and we're going to be done. In the New Testament, who replaces the temple? Jesus does, right? Jesus does. And there are tons of texts that show us that Jesus is the one who replaces the temple. Um, I read on Sabbath, John um, 1.14, where the word becomes flesh and makes, pitches his tent among us or tabernacles with us. Um, another text that I mentioned was the text from Revelation 21 where, where John says, I didn't see any temple there. He says, because God and the Lamb, they're the temple. Because the temple is nothing more than the presence of God himself. So Christ himself, don't miss this everybody, Christ himself becomes the presence of God, the word of God, and the sacrifice of God to his people. Right? And when he leaves, how does he fulfill these things, his presence, his word, and his sacrifice among his people when he leaves? Uh, Paracletos, that's right, through the Holy Spirit, right? So Jesus and the indwelling Jesus is the temple. So just as Old Testament believers turn to the temple in faith in God, looking to him and use the temple as a center of life. New Testament believers, we turn to Christ through his spirit, through his word. We turn to Christ to be the center of life. And then when we, when we move towards the promise of if my people who call by my name will humble themselves and pray, we turn to Christ in that way. We turn to Christ with a whole heart. That's the solution for all of our problems. Jesus Christ himself. Jesus himself. I want to read a couple of verses that just flesh this out and then we're going to be done. Two verses, Matthew 16, 24 and 25. We all know this text very well. In fact, we know it pretty much by heart. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Look at what Christ says. He says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him what, everybody? Deny himself. And what, everybody? Take up his cross. And what? And follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Right here, Jesus is saying the exact same thing that this text is saying when it says, if they will humble themselves and pray. Really, it's saying this whole idea of turning over the entire life. Not seeking a solution, not seeking a fix in an area, but turning over the entire life. In, in the language that Jesus uses, he uses the language of denying yourself and identifying yourself with an instrument of death, which is the cross. In order to be a disciple, your whole life must be put to death. And if you try to save it, you're going to lose it. And you'll never be a disciple. Right? Right? That's, just, that's the same thing now here about the eyes of the Lord range to and fro throughout the earth to throw, show himself strong on, be, on behalf of those whose heart is whole towards him. This is the person who has died to their natural self and all of their life 
is found in the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. One last text. Galatians chapter 6. Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians 6, verses 14 and 15. Look at what it says. But God forbid that I should boast or glory. This is Paul speaking. He said, God forbid that I should boast or, or be happy or celebrate or have joy or confidence in anything else except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He glories in the cross. Why? By whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Do you hear that radical death that has taken place in him? He lives in this world, but it's no longer him living. Galatians chapter 6, 14 and 15. It's no longer him that's living. He says, I have been crucified to this world. Not only that, but the world has been crucified. I'm dead to the world and the world is dead to me. Complete death. Death. That's the problem. That's the problem. We want to live on and have improvement. We want to live on and get an upgrade, a tweak, a fix here and there. We want to live on and just have this area of my life to be better. We don't understand. No. It only works when all of you has been put to death. You're crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to you. He brings it home in the next verse. Verse 15, for in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Circumcision and uncircumcision re reflects two different views of life and approaches to religion among his audience in Galatia. Those who are being circumcised are saying, you've got to be circumcised, and that has to be your vow, your external vow or commitment that you're going to live your life for God. Those who don't want to be circumcised are saying, we're living our life for God in this way over here, right? And we take pride in these things over here, right? But he's saying, he's saying, no, it's not your vows. It's not your resolutions. It's not your commitment. It's not your, your sign and your mark of faithfulness, neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything. But what, everybody? But a new creation. How do you get a new creation? By death and resurrection. Here's what the Lord is trying to show us. He's not interested in us giving him our natural lives. And that's what we often want to do. Lord, I love you. Lord, I have zeal. Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I love you, Lord. I just want to give you my whole self. I want to be completely yours. But that's my whole natural self. He wants to take that whole natural self and put it to death. He wants you to reckon that whole natural self with all its good intentions. Because he knows that even the best that comes from that natural self is as filthy rags. Even our good intentions is mixed with selfishness and self-seeking. So we reckon that natural self dead. Then he raises up again, us up again by giving us the life of Christ through his spirit. And that life is the life he wants us to give to him. The life of Christ. You hear me today? He does not want our natural life. Because we think we can preserve ourselves and serve him anyhow. And he's saying, no. The only way you can be mine, the only way I can be the center, the only way for any of this stuff to work is for all of you to accept death with my son that happened on Calvary. And life in his name. I'll end with this quote by Oswald Chambers. Anybody know Oswald Chambers? Anybody? Oswald Chambers was a preacher, son of a preacher, who was unknown in his life, 
and after he died, he was relatively unknown. He was an obscure person. But after he died, at a, an untimely death in his early 40s, his wife took his sermons and collected them, and they ended up becoming compiled into a devotional book called My Utmost for His Highest. Have you heard of that devotional book? And millions of people, 13 million plus books, have been sold. And this is what he says on January 4th. Natural devotion may be enough to attract us to Jesus, to make us feel his irresistible charm, but it will never make us disciples. Natural devotion will deny Jesus. No matter how devoted you are with your natural self, you're going to deny Jesus because your natural self is always going to meet its limit. There's always a part of you that you don't know and can't plan for and can't anticipate. The natural self says, Lord, I will even die with you. That's the natural self. Full of zeal and fervor, right? But it will deny Jesus. Always falling short of what it means to truly follow him. Jesus, so Paul says, we have to be united in his death so that we can be united with him in life. He wants the resurrected life, he wants a new creation. So turn to a neighbor and take just 10 seconds to share with your neighbor. This is what stood out to me tonight. This is what the Lord is saying to me. Pray with your partner for whatever that is, and then I'm going to close from the front.
Thank you. 